Marlins ace, Cy Young winner in 2022, Sandy Algandara will not be traded this offseason anyway. This is Locked on Marlins. You are Locked on Marlins, your daily podcast on the Miami Marlins. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Greetings from England and welcome to Locked On Marlins, your daily Marlins pod. I am your host, Peter Pratt. Hit me up at Miami Marlins underscore UK. Thanks for making Locked On Marlins your first listen of the day, guys. Uh, this is your team every day and it's part of the Locked On podcast network reminder there's also a youtube channel hit subscribe on the youtube channel let me know your thoughts on the news sandy algantara will not be traded this offseason craig mish sources close to craig which probably means sandy is reporting that he will not be moved this offseason i wish he'd have stopped short of that by saying sandy algantara will not be traded full stop that would have been nice but the Marlins not looking to move Sandy this specific offseason. The right move? What does the future hold? Tons of question marks on a rebuilding Marlins. No doubt about it. This episode, though, is sponsored by our good friends over at Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use the code Locked On MLB for twenty dollars off your first purchase. Terms apply. Tons to get into, guys. We're going to start with Sandy Alcantara not being traded this offseason. Uh, Vallente Beozo dazzles in game one against the Phils. That was two days ago now. Edward Cabrera not yet fixed. Unfortunately, uh, Edward Cabrera touched up a touch in game two. And Jack Chisholm Jr., yes, former Marlins superstar, now Yankees superstar, heads to the IL the first time this season. Jazz lands on the IL. I want to talk about his start with the Yankees, uh, the reaction to this news as well, which I was a little bit, you know, unhappy with, but expected, I guess, because it's Twitter, right? And, uh, you know, things can get loose. Uh, just also want to call out, hopefully the audio, the visuals stick. I'm still on holiday, still trying to squeeze in episodes here and there in, in between kind of loads of family stuff, loads of family time. So bear with me, guys. We're not quite on the full usual schedule, but even through vacation, we still got some Locked On Marlins content for you guys, so stick with me. Let's start with the big news. Craig Mish calling out that Sandy Alcantara won't be traded this offseason. I spoke about it a few months back in advance of the deadline, saying even though Sandy may not be available this year, could there be calls on Sandy? Uh, maybe there were, maybe there weren't. I don't know. We then get to head towards the offseason. We're seeing Sandy more. We're seeing him throwing more. Um, he was on the broadcast recently as well, talking about, you know, the level of intensity he's throwing at, you know, 75%, 80% at this point, everything's feeling good. Everything's trending in the right direction. You have to wonder with Sandy, if, if the Marlins were, were in it this year, let's say it was 23 and the Marlins were in the mix. They were headed to the postseason. You have to wonder whether Sandy would have actually made it back. To have maybe pitched in September, maybe even pitched in a postseason run. I don't even know. Um, you know, the Marlins, naturally and rightly, considering the predicament this year, are going slow with Sandy, which is the right thing. I get the sense that Sandy doesn't like to do anything slow regarding baseball activities or sporting activities or anything. So you do have to wonder if if Sandy, if the Marlins needed him, this year, whether he could have made it back. I don't actually know that. But either way, what we're seeing is he's trending in absolutely the right direction. We then had the news that the Marlins are facing off against the Pirates again for opening day, opening series, opening weekend. Marlins, Pirates, back-to-back -back years. Everyone then started to ask the question, who will be the opening day starter for the Marlins? That's the question. Um, we know likely who will be for the Pirates, all, all things being well, and Paul Skeens. So the question now is, is will it be Skeens versus Sandy on opening day? And with Craig News, Craig News? 
<laughs> Craig Mish's news. Uh, it's all but a lock if Sandy is healthy and has returned and everything is A-OK. If he's available, Sandy gets the ball clearly opening day. And the same probably will be true of Paul Skeens for the Pirates. So we are going to get that juicy matchup. I did see someone tweeting about it a few months back when this was announced that this should be like the primetime game. You know, Sandy versus Skeens as an opening day matchup should be primed. At the end of the day, everyone's got their aces going. You know, it's one against one. There's going to be tons of juicy matchups, clearly. But Sandy Alcantara, former Cy Young winner, making his return. Paul Skeens, we'll see whether he becomes rookie of the year in 24. The Pirates, you know, they're in the same situation that the Marlins faced into with Yuri Perez, where you, you have an innings limit, you're trying to manage him, etc., We'll see if Skeens actually pitches the rest of the way. Pirates have not been good after the deadline. And so all of a sudden, their chances are sliding. So do they look to shut down Skeens sooner rather than later? Maybe. Maybe they will. Nevertheless, Skeens will likely be the opening day starter. So will be Sandy Alcantara if both guys are healthy. That is one hell of a juicy matchup. No doubt about it. So we all know what's been going on in this Mar Marlins organization for the past you know, eight months, however however long it's been since Peter Bendix has been um, running the show. We all know what's happened at the deadline. We all saw what happened in May. We all heard the rumors around what the Marlins were trying to do in the offseason with Lozado, with Cabrera, etc. The Marlins are, are signaling that they continue to prioritize the farm system at this point. Well, I think that's a question for us now. What we know with the way that the Rays operate is that they will move assets that are approaching free agency or where the value is at its max or its peak. I think that's really interesting for Sandy here because at a high level, yes, he is every day that passes is clearly a day less of control. Right now it's injured control, so it's irrelevant. But the, the main point there is the Rays look to make the moves when the guys are at their peak. Sandy Alcantara, in terms of value, I don't think is a peak value right now because he's not healthy. Let's go back to the Luis Arias situation, by the way. And I've spent quite a bit of time on Twitter talking about this the past couple of days, driven by, obviously, the you know, seeing Arias back with the Padres. And when you reflect on when the Marlins moved Arias in early May, that, in reality, wasn't quite peak. It wasn't, but it was as near to peak as it could be. Peak was the off-season. Coming off the season he had with two full years of control, that was the peak time to move Arias. The Marlins got into deep conversations around that time, obviously with the Padres. They couldn't get a deal done. The season then starts, the Marlins season ends, and effectively then Bendix, I think, goes back to the Padres and says, listen, let's make it happen. We'll eat the dough. We'll eat the dough. So they didn't sell Arias at peak value, but as near to peak as they could have got, in my opinion. More general topics been going on with Luis Arias in the past couple of days about some of the descriptions that I find crazy, you know, around the fact that he's just about a league average guy. He's a near replacement level guy is the descriptions that I'm seeing on Twitter from Marlins fans, from other fans, whatever it might be, which is completely crazy in my opinion. Uh, Arias is exceptional at what he does and he hits baseballs better than anyone else. Considering that is the fundamental part of the game. Offense wins. You have to score to win and to, to to win, you have to get on base. You have to have hits. All of the rest around defensive ability, defensive metrics, speed, power. Yeah, they play a part. But fundamentally, baseball is about hitting the baseball and scoring runs. What we've seen with the Padres since Arias has been there, more recently in particular, has been... They've absolutely been one of the best in, in, in Major League Baseball at doing that. Arias is playing hurt, okay. But to claim that Luis Arias, based on 
you know, looking at war or whatever it might be is a near replacement level player is ludicrous. It's ludicrous. It doesn't make any sense. I, I don't know. People either aren't watching the games or they just are so connected to war or WRC plus as the only way of an analyzing a player. Trust me, you go and watch Luis Arias against the Marlins, and we, we all did. What did you see? You saw Impact Knox that won a game directly for the Padres. Well, that's one That's one war. That was one win. Chalk that one up. Big hit in the eighth, big hit in the tenth um, in that specific game. Game two, I think it was. So I know I've gone off on a bit of a rant around Luis Arias, but it has irked me. It has irked me that this viewpoint has been, you know, surfacing now arises moved now we get the marlins fans chirping up well he's a you know a a near replacement level player it's a nonsense it's a nonsense just because his war stat which is a made-up stat says that doesn't mean it's true and just because he can't steal 40 bags doesn't mean he's bang average he's the best in the biz at what he does he's about to win a third batting title in a row how in the hell could that be described as a near replacement level player? Listen, I've seen the replacement level players. The Marlins bottom half of the lineup is filled with them. Absolutely filled with them. They're replacement level players. Otto Lopez is a replacement level player. Emmanuel Rivera is a replacement level player. If to throw Arias into that bucket is insanity. So check yourselves and check Arias. <laughs> All right, I want to carry on this Sandy Alcantara conversation. Uh, We're going to carry on that. But before we do that, uh, let's firstly let you know about our good friends over at Game Time. Yes, sir. And guys, you know, it's going to be heating up to get some tickets rolling now, no doubt about it. And Game Time is an authorized ticket marketplace of Major League Baseball, which makes getting tickets faster and easier. Prices on the Game Time app actually go down the closer it gets to first pitch. With killer last-minute deals, all-in prices, views from your seat, and their lowest price guarantee, Game Time takes the guesswork out of buying MLB tickets. So, for me, when I think about Game Time, the main things is all-in pricing. You can toggle this feature um, on, and you see all of the totals up front. No surprise fees at checkout. If you you can also get that panoramic view from your seat in seat views, and of course their lowest price guarantee. Game time will credit you one hundred and ten percent of the difference if you find the same seat in the same row for less. So if that sounds juicy, then head on over to Game Time, download the Game Time app, create an account, and use the code Locked On MLB for twenty dollars off your first purchase. Terms apply. Uh, again, create an account, redeem the code Locked On MLB for twenty dollars off. Download Game Time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. Welcome back to Locked On Marlins, guys. It's Thursday, the 15th of August. The Marlins unfortunately couldn't uh, win game two. They gave themselves a chance. They started hard, but unfortunately, Eddie Cabrera getting fully touched up by Kyle Schwarber with a big knock from Schwarber. Uh, Nevertheless, We are here and we're talking a lot of Sandy Alcantara. The main news, you know, in a season where wins and losses really don't matter and actually losses are more valuable than wins in some sense, this is all about looking ahead to the future. A lot of question marks. All of a sudden, the Marlins offense in 25, it looks like it could be extremely young. It looks like it could be exciting because, well, there's going to be some new names to track and follow. Whether they're any good, we don't know. And so that's up for debate. But in theory, this offense in 25 could be interesting. Young guys, power profile on the corners, new guys, a new, a complete you know, offense, a completely new offense effectively transitioning through here that has been assembled at the deadline. The question then turns to is who's pitching? Who will be back? As we already talked about. Peter Bendix tried to move Lozado in the offseason. Again, let's go back to that. Why was he trying to do that? Because Lozado was at peak value at that moment in time. They couldn't get a deal done. They missed the opportunity. And unfortunately, we're going to be a year down the line where Lozado's value has potentially halved, maybe injured again. 
one less year of control. The value isn't there. It's about making deals at peak value for the raise in this model. It's not about extensions. We find good players. We enjoy them for a few years and we move them. That's the model. Never buy a Marlins jersey with a player's name on the back ever again, guys. Never, ever do that. So why does this matter for Sandy? Firstly, for me, for Sandy, I think it's important for the Marlins to signal to their ace, their leader, that give him peace of mind, considering all he's done for this organization, that he won't be moved this offseason. Sandy, we want you back. The reason they want Sandy back is they want him to be, to demonstrate that he is who he was in 22, 23, some variants of, of the two. But effectively, they want him to be back and healthy. Why? Because right now he isn't at peak value. If Sandy rocks back, has a great first half next year, then you have to think at the deadline, that is probably peak value for Sandy Alcantara. Reminder on the contract situation, because I think this is you know, very important, clearly. Next season, Sandy uh, will be earning $17.3 million from the Marlins. In 2026, he also will be earning $17.3 million. And he then has a club option, final year of his extension, at $21 million. That comes with a buyout uh, of $2 million if, uh, if indeed the club wants to get out of that. So effectively, you can have Sandy Alcantara for nearly, what's that? It's nearly 40 million? No, 60 million. No, 80 million. I don't even know. Nevertheless, you can have Sandy for three more seasons, including the club option. Um, so as we kind of tick along into next season, even if you move Sandy this season, you will still have two years of full cl club control beyond the next season's campaign. So effectively, they will be moving him. If they move him at the deadline, it will be the same time albeit the, the contract situation and the value is different, but at the same time that they move Jazz Chisholm Jr., two and a half years of control remaining. Unfortunately, so again, going back to it, this offense could be fun. Things could be interesting. 2025, the question is, well, who's pitching? Who's going to be around? Yuri won't, won't be there for the start of the season. Sandy will, and the Marlins need Sandy to be good. I'm going to talk about his impact on the team more generally shortly. Beyond that, you've then got where's Lozado, where's Braxton Garrett, what's Edward Cabrera doing, has he been moved, where's Max Meyer? There is the make, uh, where's Ryan Weathers, where's Vente Beozo? Let's not forget Beozo in the mix. So listen, this, this rotation, there's a lot of question marks going into it. But as we always say, if healthy, there's a good, decent rotation there, led by Sandy Alcantara. The Marlins are based on their pitching staff. That's what this organization remains built around. It's built around the pitching staff and the quality of such. So we don't know the future for Lozado. We don't know the future for Yuri Perez. We don't know the future for Edward Cabrera. There's a lot of unknowns headed into this campaign. But one known now is that Sandy will be in the rotation starting for the Marlins. No trade this offseason. And... Then the Marlins then have a, a view of, well, let's see how it goes in 25. How aggressive are they with some of these recent acquisitions? How aggressive are they in other trade moves this offseason? I think the really interesting thing, and I think we have saw this with, you know, some of the moves the Marlins made is, and, and this I think was particularly you know, poignant to the, the, the Orioles trade. When we reflect on that, where when you start to deal with clubs that are good right now, the Orioles being one of them, it's what you end up getting back. We saw with the Arias deal that they got basically a young guy that's miles away, that's a headliner, and then a couple of other guys that are a little bit nearer. But when we then look at the Orioles deal, you end up getting two guys, the, one of which, both of which are, have got major league experience. And the Orioles will likely identify them as, you know, these are movable guys. 
these are in their in their situation probably like bench fringe triple a guys because they've just got so much talent elsewhere so all of a sudden i think the marlins went into that orioles conversation and they've been in the orioles conversations for a while i think they went in prioritizing a different type of player i think they went in looking for younger guys but because of the 40 man aspects the rule 5 aspects what's already on these rosters the opportunities that were created all both with the puck deal with the jazz deal and also with the trevor rogers deal in particular um all of those brought you back guys that are much nearer being big league ready than maybe they'd anticipated because they're the movable guys at this point you only have so many guys on a 40 man roster you only have so many guys that you can play on your active roster and actually if you don't value these guys as impact for now, right now, then maybe they're the guys that are moved, the fringe guys, the bench guys. And that's how I think the Orioles viewed, you know, Connor Norby, Carl Stowers. I think they looked at it and thought, not convinced. Not convinced that they're going to impact us now or next year. Um, for as much as a lot of people like Stowers and like Norby, we'll wait and see. But I think that it changed things for what this roster looks like. And we're going to dig into that as we get into the offseason because. You know, the Marlins could have a very young roster next year. Let's see how aggressive they are with things. But the question then is, with Sandy, if the Marlins are in it, which is probably a little bit unlikely, but if they are in it, then maybe that changes things. Let's hit the final ad, and then let's continue to talk about Sandy Alcantara, because I didn't expect to talk 30 minutes about Sandy. But to be honest with you, Sandy deserves an hour-long episode. He's that good. He's that important to the Marlins um, and locked on Marlins, frankly. Um, so. Before we do that, let's let you know about our good friends over at Liquid IV. Yes, sir. And guys, you've got to stay hydrated, of course, in the summer. I, I know that firsthand, being on the beach every day for the past three days. And when you're taking in America's pastime, don't forget to hydrate with Liquid IV's popsicle firecracker flavor. A surefire summer hit. Get hydrated with electrolytes, essential vitamins, and clinically tested nutrients from the number one powdered hydration brand in America because baseball and summer go together like liquid IV and indulgent high duration. They've got tons of flavors, guys, as well. Make sure you get over to the website to find all of the flavors. Blast off with the iconic summer flavor of Popsicle Firecracker. That is a festive blend of citrus fueled lemon lime, tar cherry, and raspberry flavors. They've got tons on their website, including my favorite, Pina Colada. Um, no more thirsty summers. When you indulge in hydration with Liquid IV, get 20% off your first order of Liquid IV when you go to liquidiv.com and use the code MLB at checkout. That's 20% off your first order when you shop Better Hydration today using promo code MLB at liquidiv.com. Welcome back to Locked on Marlins, guys. Final segment here with me, Peter Pratt. And we continue to talk about Sandy Alcantara. Uh, Craig Mish with the news that he won't be traded this offseason. Why? Well, the short answer is Sandy right now, his tradable value is not at peak value. Still three years of club, con club control headed into the 2025 campaign. The Marlins, in my opinion, will look to trade Sandy Alcantara and they will likely look to move him for an absolute haul or being well in the 2025 deadline. That's the reality we're facing into. We've seen it with Jazz. We've seen it with other guys. Peter Bendix to restock this farm will make disciplined decisions and some tough decisions in order to prioritize future sustained success years on years on years within the playoff contention. And for that, collateral damage is required. This is Peter Bendix's description, by the way. Not really mine. But anyway, we know what the plan is. He's laid it out and we've seen it at this deadline. Sandy Alcantara will be traded, in my opinion, at the deadline or in and around the deadline in 2025. It's going to be extremely painful because Sandy Alcantara has been one of the best Marlins players ever ever one of the best players ever in my opinion and before peter bendix arrived i saw sandy alcantara being potentially 
probably the first jersey number retirement that the Marlins have ever had. They still haven't retired a number. But I could see a situation before Bendix arrived that Sandy ends up staying with the Marlins the majority of his career and ends up having his jersey retired. I also want to call out that I could absolutely see Sandy coming back and winning a Cy Young in 25 or even 26 or even both. Sandy Alcantara is an absolute machine. He's an absolute stud. There is no one like Sandy Alcantara in the game. He is the most important player to this Marlins organization. He will be the most important player probably for the next organization, wherever he lands. Why is that? Because he frankly goes seven, eight, or nine every single time. Every single time, seven, eight, or nine quality innings. It, it And we saw it this year with the Marlins. Having that and that stability, that anchor, creates a, a significant ripple effect right through the next four days. From bullpen usage, other starters, everything. Everything is built and hinges around Sandy Alcantara going seven, eight, or nine every single start. He never misses starts. He always goes deep. And the bullpen knows it can have a snooze whenever Sandy's on the mound. That then impacts the rest of the week. It then means you don't have a fully gassed bullpen. It means, like we saw in 23, that when you need the pen, the pen's there and it can be used and rolled out every day when the games are tight and the games will be tight. Sandy is, he's so impactful. It's, it's hard to measure. It actually is hard to measure because what he's, what he does on the field is immeasurable what happens in the next four days. What also with Sandy is just how big of a leader he is in the clubhouse with the pitching staff, the young rotation, everything. Sandy does so much for the Marlins. And I know, you know, I know Jazz. I've talked about Jazz a lot. Obviously, I love Jazz from an offensive standpoint. I love the electricity that he brings. I love the tools he has, everything about it. But Sandy Alcantara is in multiple classes and leagues above what Jazz is and ever has been for the Marlins. And I'm perfectly okay to admit that. Sandy Alcantara has just been one of the best players in the game for some time and will return in 25 and will continue to be one of the best players in the game. The painful thing will come is when he is eventually traded in 2025, in my opinion. We should all start preparing for that situation now because that's going to be the reality. And we should enjoy everything we see from Sandy in 25 for the Marlins. Some other organization is going to benefit from what the Marlins have been able to do with Sandy and what Sandy has done for himself for the next potentially two and a half seasons beyond what the Marlins see. Nevertheless, it's great that we know Sandy will be there. And as Marlins fans, we will get to enjoy him as a Marlin for at least, at least opening day, but I think for a significant period. On the business side, this makes total sense. Sandy Alcantara right now is not a peak value. If you get Sandy back, real Sandy back for three months or so, two months, three months, whatever it might be to start 25, then he is back at peak value. Then you are looking at probably one of the biggest trade packages you have ever seen for any player ever. I don't know. We'll see. But that's the type of haul we're talking about for Sandy. That's how important he is. That's how good he is. That you're going to see one of the biggest deals in Major League Baseball history when Sandy is eventually moved. Guys, that's been Locked on Marlins for Thursday, the 15th of August. We've talked about Sandy Alcantara and Sandy Alcantara alone. A little bit of Lewis Arias, you know, snuck in there. Let me know your thoughts. Let me know how you see this playing out. But Peter Bendix has already laid it down. Not going to move in the offseason. He's not a peak value. We're going to wait until he's back healthy. And when he's back healthy, he will be moved to help the future. And the reality is the package that Sandy should return should be one of the biggest ever in Major League Baseball. Look forward to seeing you soon.